Hey everyone, thanks for joining us a little bit early. Appreciate the early crowd as always. It is 1.59 on my computer, so I'm going to wait until probably like 2.01 to get started. Um, so if you're in here early, go grab some water, take a snack break, and join us again in about 60 seconds, and then we will kick it off. Okay, <clears throat> we are getting closer to 201. It just changed on my time. So I am gonna go ahead and kick us off. We've got a great fireside chat today. I am super excited to talk all things AI in commercial real estate. Um, I'm gonna be interviewing my good friend Dave here and we're gonna get into some good topics. So let's kick it off, Dave. So like I said, um, my name is Jenny. I am on the product marketing team at Least Cake, and I help kind of learn what's going on in the market and bring to market some new exciting things, AI being one of them. And of course, I work really closely with Dave, who actually is the brains behind everything that you see happening with our AI tools at Least Cake. You want to say hi, Dave? Hello, everybody. And it's it is it's like a, it's a team effort. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a willing yeah. a participant, but it is a team effort with an incredibly um uh, impressive engineering staff that does all the hard work. Um, I just happen to be the uh, poster child for them. So I'm here to represent us today. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. Um, so today's like webinar style is a little bit more relaxed and laid back. We're calling it a fireside chat. Um, the style for today is just really getting into what is AI mean for the commercial real estate business? What does it mean for people who own multiple units specifically? And how is Lease Cake like, what, what are we dealing with it? Um, how are we using it to our advantage? How are we helping our customers with it? So I'm going to interview Dave for about 15, 20 minutes, and then we're going to show you some stuff behind the scenes that we've got working on that might be interesting to those who want to kind of dip their toes into AI and see what it can do for them. So Dave, let's, let's get started. Sure. All right. First things first, it is no secret, right? AI is everywhere. It's in the news. It is constantly AI this, AI that. So what's really going on? So yeah, it's, it's hard to open up any type of media outlet, whether it be your traditional newspapers or blogs or looking at any kind of videos and not seeing some of the names that you're seeing here. Um, ChatGPT, uh, um, OpenAI, Sora, which is probably one of the newest ones that are getting a lot of buzz. If you haven't seen any of the videos, I highly recommend them. Go take a look at it. That's the text-to-video stuff that OpenAI is working on. Um, Google's Bard, which has recently been rebranded to Gemini. Um, OpenAI is also their, their DALI interface, which is a lot of text-to-graphics. And I'll show you an example of that here in a little bit. And then Anthropic, and they're coming out with their Claude AI. And there's others. You don't see... I don't have Facebook's Llama platform on here or anybody else, but these are just some of the names that you're seeing. And I, and I think the one of the big reasons why is, is there's a significant amount of capital going into these into these companies. Um, I was taking a look at Crunchbase, and I think in Q1 of 2024, over 20% of all venture capital has been going towards companies who are focusing on solving problems with AI. Um, that's That's tremendous. I mean, I haven't seen anything like this since... The beginning of like the, when when the web was becoming um, more and more popular, but it's just doing it at such a crazy speed. And I think one of the big things to keep in mind here too is a lot of this is because there's been such huge advancements on the hardware side. Um, anybody here on the webinar who's got positions in any of the uh, the uh, the segment uh, leaders, Nvidia or TSMC or AMD, Intel, I'm sure you've seen a significant bump in your portfolios 
because all these companies are spending massive amounts of money with these hardware providers because the hardware the hardware has become really really um, impressive recently and just to give you some perspective of what i mean by that is there is a there is a supercomputer out in tennessee called frontier um, you may think of it as Skynet for any of you Terminator fans out there. It is the fastest thing on the planet today, but it's got several different platforms coming after it um, because, again, everybody wants a, a piece of this. But to give you some perspective, this thing is measured in exaflops. I'd even look that up, what exaflops are. An exaflop means that it's doing one quintillion operate floating point operations a second. That's a billion billions. It's a lot of zero, 18 zeros. Um, so for additional perspective, that's the equivalent of taking 65,000 iPhone 13s, putting them together to reach that type of speed. And then so for more perspective, if we want to go back in time, an individual iPhone is about 75,000 times faster than everything NASA had at its disposal when it put um, a man on the moon on Apollo 11. So this is an incredible amount of hardware uh, acceleration in a short amount of time. And it's probably the single biggest driver of why you're seeing so much stuff going on in the uh, in the industry today. Hmm. So lots around the hardware, but what about things in like our everyday lives? Yeah, so, so look, take a look at some use cases here. So um, up top here, I've got some of the terms you might hear and below some some of the uh, uh, logos you might be seeing in everyday life, depending on, on where you go, what you use and what you do. So let's take a look at machine learning. So you can think of machine learning as just, pumping a massive amount of data into one of these supercomputers, running software that's designed to learn as much as it, much as it can about the, the, the data behind it. And it's used in a multitude of use cases. So I've got some of the platforms here that you know, um, whether it be Instagram or Facebook or Netflix, YouTube, Amazon, they have lots of different use cases for them. Everything from you wonder why you're on YouTube and you blink and it's been three hours. Well, it's because they do an incredibly good job of telling you what you should look at next. That's all coming from ML. Whether you're on Amazon, it says you like this, there's a pretty good chance you're probably going to buy this. That's coming from ML. Lots of different machine learning applications that are in use today, today that you're using, I'm sure, on a daily basis. The second one I wanted to make note of is NLP, natural language processing. Um, the, the, probably the most common use cases you see here, and NLP has been around for a long time, but the one where the most advancements has been, um, and I say that a bit tongue in cheek, cause anybody who's ever tried to have a conversation with Siri would probably laugh at me, but you think of, Hey, Google or Siri or Alexa, um, this is where they're using NLP technology and it allows you to have a conversation with the interface and it will go back, take those words, process them, understand what your, your intention is perform an action, and then give you something back. But anybody who's used these can know how frustrating it is. Um, mm -hmm. th just a quick anecdote. Just this morning, my my six and seven-year-old daughters were, were having breakfast and they're Disney fanatics. And they just, they're asking Alexa to play I'm a Star from the movie Wish. Anybody hasn't seen it, it's a really cute movie. There's a really cool song in there called I'm a Star. Well, let's just say that after four or five attempts, I'm screaming at Alexa to stop because it, I, four explicit lyric versions of songs with the word star <laughs> in it up, and you couldn't do anything about it. I just, I, I had it and I had some choice words and I'm sure I'm going to have to deal with my wife later when my kids throw me under the bus because I was just so frustrating. So it's just an example of how when it works, it's amazing. And when it doesn't, it can get very frustrating. AI is not perfect. And we're going to talk about that as we get throughout. But for the stuff that's happening recently around generative AI, this is the one I think that is the most exciting. Things like Gemini, things like OpenAI with Dolly and ChatGPT and Sora and with Anthropic and, and their Claude uh, uh, experience, the ability to have text to video, text to imagery, text to charts, text to build you design specs. You could do all kinds of different things here and it just really changed the game because it's different than suggesting something. It's different than, than just retrieving a piece of information. It's actually creating information. And it's doing it in a way that can become extreme, help people become extremely, extremely efficient. Hmm. So AI is not necessarily new. We kind of have some older styles and processes, but there's definitely this like cusp of some new innovations coming out. So oh, if absolutely. we're talking about... If we talk about like AI creating 
content then, if it's coming out with charts and graphs and things, how accurate is it actually? Great, great question. And this is where your mileage may vary. Um, I just talked about the NLP, how it can be extremely frustrating. And and anybody who's actually tried to generate an image using um, using Dolly or something can get some pretty funny stuff back. But but here's an here's a real world example. Just getting preparing for this webinar, I knew I wanted to put the slide in here, and I knew I wanted to have some visual depiction that we could all look at as I, we were talking about uh, a, a broader a broader theme here. So here's how I started. And, and Jenny's heard me say this a million times, and so she'll probably get sick and tired of me saying it. But I think of generative AI as, in many respects as it relates to the human using the technology as a partnership. It's, it helps make the person more efficient. It, it, it allows me personally, I, you know, a lot of my use cases, it helps me move from being an author into an editor. So here's a real world example of what I mean. I was looking for some imagery here. I had a general idea. I said, I went into, I used ChatGPT um, and I said, you know, I'm, I'm going to be doing a webinar and I'm really interested in having a slide that talks about accuracy. And I want to take an angle about how the, the advancements in AI are helping me by supplementing what I'm already thinking and providing me answers and being almost like a muse to me, helping me think about things. And so and I said, what I'd like to do is come up with some imagery that helps connote that feeling. And it came back and wrote out like four or five different examples of what it thought. One of them was, how about these two entities holding puzzle pieces that are coming together? I thought, wow, that's, that's really good. So this is where it kind of transfers from it's doing some of the authoring of the idea to me doing some of the editing. And so I said, hey, that's great. Do me a favor, generate me an image. And that's what you see on the left. And so as a human, I look at that and I say, okay, I like where you're going with this, but it's a little odd that these two pieces don't look like they naturally fit. So I went back and said, I need to do a small edit. Please do me a favor and make sure the puzzle pieces look like they're designed to connect to each other. And here's a wonderful example of where it listens in some respects and kind of decides what it wants to do. I never ask, put a coat on the person, give that person hair, change the, change the robot to do anything else. So this is this is I thought this was a really good depiction of how the idea about the puzzle piece, I think was brilliant. The idea about it's listening to me bringing the puzzle pieces together, it listened very well. But there needed to be some guardrails around. I didn't want you to change necessarily the people or the robot in there. And this plays into some of the demos we're going to be doing here uh, later, where you'll see the interaction between the human myself and how the AI can help the human achieve a, 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 a desired outcome. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> no, that makes sense. Okay. That's a great intro into AI, but I think most of us on here are interested in commercial real estate. So let's switch gears to that a little bit. Yeah. Um, so Perfect. focusing on real estate, let's talk a little bit about, you know, how what's AI doing in these areas? Yeah. So so now you got a little bit of a background. So you're thinking about, you know, AI is all around us. What are the types of things that will happen in real estate? Um, before we get into minimizing risk, I mean, there's some that you've probably already seen today or, or just not too much of a stretch. So if you're on the asset ownership side of real estate, if you're a landlord, if you're a REIT, something like that, you can imagine uh, machine learning is a great opportunity to take lots of different demographic data, lots of different market trends, put it in, have it come out and give some calculations around where's the market going, what's the market doing, things of that nature. Um, if you, I mean, you, you could do things like weather patterns. Um, like one of the things that that frontier computer I, I failed to mention was it does things like black hole analysis and climate change weather patterns and obviously a lot of machine learning. These models can help predict things like when's the best time to build properties. So you can use it for things like that. You could use it for chatbots for helping with if you've got um, you, you want to work with your tenants, your tenants could be provided a chatbot. So if they have, have they have questions, the AI could come back and respond back and prevent the need to have. 24 by 7 human interaction, you could have a lot of that stuff put online. Now, I know chatbots sometimes be really, really annoying, but I assure you they're getting a lot better. Now, at Least Cake, we look at it primarily from the tenant side. So if you think about someone who's using our platform, they've got anywhere between five to a thousand locations, and they're trying to manage all the risk around their real estate and their location. So think leases and franchise agreements and licenses and permits and inspections and all those different types of things. 
So when the way that we look at AI is similar to how we look at how do we deliver value to those clients. And we think of it from a, a three-step, excuse me, a three-step process. The first one is all those details are locked away typically in either physical file cabinets or, or digital file cabinets in terms of Dropbox, PDFs, things of that nature. So all the risk, all the knowledge, all the details that are there, they're locked up. And so the first trick is how do we get that information out? Historically, it's been a very, very manual effort, and it will continue to be for a little while. But what's happening with AI is it helps, it's helping supplement the person doing the job by bringing answers to the person and eliminating the need for the person to have to go searching for a lot of that stuff. And that's part of the demo we're going to show here in a second. I'll, I'll quickly touch on some of these other ones, and we'll get back to them here at the end. But think of analysis as the analyze uh, uh, section is what can you do with all that data once it's actually uh, out of the documents? Think of all that rich, the rent data, CAM information. You can think of all the clause languages, all the permit dates, all the work related to build outs, all that stuff. What can you learn from it and how could that information be, be organized in a way that makes it useful and actionable? And then lastly, how do you democratize all this information? You can imagine where it's sticking in a file cabinet. Usually it's like one person might have access to it and that person becomes the hub that everybody goes to to get this information. Well, how do you bring this information to your team? And what are the ways that AI can do that? And we'll talk about that here in a little bit. So let's jump into the demonstration and we'll talk, we'll, we're going to focus primarily on the abstraction piece. Then we'll come back and we'll touch a little bit on those other two areas where I think things are going into the future. So bear with me for just one second. Okay, perfect. Cool. Everyone on the line, um, Dave's going to take us into what Lee's Cake has been up to for the last little bit. And if you've got questions about what you're looking at or you just want to learn more, um, we will have Q&A at the end. So please ask your questions and we will get to them. But we're just going to kind of show you some behind the scenes stuff of what we've been up to. Great. Well, hopefully my screen shows here and you probably have a nomad yep. view us. True. Okay, great. Yep. So we're we're in Lee's Cake. This is this is just my my particular landing area here. It's just showing all the different locations in my in my fictitious company, and these locations are the result of getting information out of documents and into the system. So I'll give you a little bit of um, some real world examples here. I'm going to do a little bit of Julia Child style, where it's, the cake is kind of in the oven in certain respects, and we're going to pull it out and we're going to taste a little bit of it here. So over here on the left hand navigation, we have this area here where I can uh, in, engage with um, what we call our abstraction tool. So these are some projects that I have working here. These are some examples of, I'm working on this stuff. I may not necessarily be done yet. I did this on purpose so we can kind of take a look at it. But what you're seeing here is the beginning of me working with a couple documents. So here's an example lease. This is one that um, I was able to find on the web. Somebody was nice enough to put this out there. I've been using it as my example. It's, and it happens to be in Florida. It's from this company, Ocean Management Services, leasing the Front Street Development LLC. I've also got um, a, a fake uh, amendment here. That's an example that shows some of the different changes and amendments over time. And the reason we do that is because I want to show you that usually, typically, when you're trying to get information in, it may not always be one document. It could be multiple documents. You could be coming from a file cabinet to a system like LeaseCake, and you might have three or four different things that have happened over time. And so you've got to figure out how to get the most recent information in here. And so what we do is we allow you to handle, we work with multiple documents at the same time. So that we have a three, one through three step process in here as it relates to abstraction. So the first thing is you get the documents in here. And what's happening behind the scenes is the documents are being OCR'd. Uh, that stands for Optical Character rec uh, Recognition. It is that technology has been around for decades, a long time, but it's vital in that it translates the things you see on the page, whether they look like this or whether they're actual signatures into workable text behind the scenes. This allows me to interact with both the document itself or actual text should the document be handwritten and I need to convert it into text, it does all that stuff. The other reason why this is important is because behind the scene what happens is there's a process that goes on that breaks this stuff up so that when we get to this next step, the AI knows where it can target to try to find information and bring back some answers. And where that's useful is when we get into step two, which is the details. Now, this is where all the, 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 all the labor is. Um, historically, what you've got is you got a bunch of people, they're looking at a document, they're scanning through it, they're trying to find details. 
And what our goal is, and this is our in our first version of this, is that we try to bridge that gap by introducing um, our AI mod, our, our, our AI tool, which we call CakeBot. So it's just a little icon here. If you see this anywhere in the app, it just means you're invoking um, CakeBot so that it can do do uh, bring back in details for you. But let me show you some examples I noticed in working with this one prior to the, to the webinar I thought were, were key. I won't bore you to death with going through every single individual field here, but let me give you some examples of one where I think it's it's really interesting. So one of the things we do is we create a location automatically when you're putting in a new lease because the location may not already be in the system. And then you may have to find the address. So here, the, what it's doing is CakeBot is searching through the document and trying to find the address. So this is a 35-page document, and it brings it back in a handful of seconds which is just really, really useful and helpful. And you'll see here, that tells me that it's at 100 Northeast 6th Street, Unit 108, Boynton Beach, Florida, 33435. It automatically highlights it as well. So that gives me the details I need so I can quickly move that into the location address and move on and go to other things. But the reason I picked this one out is some of the nuance that's within here that we have found as being problematic with other tools that try to find this stuff that aren't leveraging the power of like OpenAI or BART or, 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 or Gemini, um, and, and that's in, there's two addresses in this paragraph. One is telling us where the actual address is of the location. The other one is telling us what the address is of the landlord's business address with the only difference being the actual unit number. And you can see here, it put, picked out the right unit number for the address. And when I come down here to the landlord details, and I'm going to look at what's the landlord's address, it's going to look through it and find the details here. And you can see it pick it, it picks out the same exact area but it picked out the 107. Those kinds of things can be really vital, both in helping accuracy, but also helping speed, okay? So anyway, I thought that was kind of a cool one to look at. I have another example here where it comes to critical clauses um, is let's say that I wanted to do something around assignments. So I wanna create an assignments clause. And so I, but I have no idea where any of that language is. So I wanna take a look at this. What it's doing now is it's looking through the base lease and it's going to tell me whether I have the ability to, let's say, sublease any of this space. And it says, you know, unfortunately, I can't. And it tells me that it's there on page eight. And there it is. Tenant may not assign this agreement or sublet it or grant any of this space. However, it's also searching through the second document, which is the amendment. And this amendment actually says that I can. This one's all about how I can sublease it and has all the details relative to that. And it can tell me exactly where it is. And so there's my grant, a grant of sublease right. And the reason this is vital is there's typically going to be multiple documents within, within one, one effort. So having something that can search through all those things, bring you back the details, show you where they are, get them in the ability to give you the ability to make a decision where you want to go. But the human is still involved here. I'm still ultimately making the decision. And that's our approach right now. We're leveraging AI to bring the details quickly to the user allowing them to make decisions and move on. And from there, then they can move through in a much faster path. So things that typically could take hours and possibly days can be rethought of in terms of minutes to get some of this information really, really quickly. Another thing that we do is we introduce chat. So if you wanna move out of the more structured chat cake bot per an individual field, you can have a conversation with the document which is really, really nice because when the document gets OCR'd, you can just chat with it because it's it's the same type of thing that's going on. You just add something here that's, um, it's just more ad hoc. So let's say that if I wanted to talk about who signed it, okay? Let's talk about some, something that actually is a signature. Let's say who signed this um, on behalf of the tenant. So I ask this question, it's going to try to figure out who um, the tenant is. So here's a great example of it not understanding what I mean at that particular point in time. If I were to say something like, what is the name of the person who signed this? Oh, I actually know what I meant. My fault. I jumped documents. I jumped documents. That's what it was. Let me go back here to this particular one. So it was actually correct because there was no signature on there because I actually failed to sign that one. So what is the name of the person who signed this? on behalf of the tenant. So it needs to know who the tenant is. And it also needs to know I'm trying to figure out who actually signed it. And so what it does is that the name of the person who signed this on behalf of the tenant is Front Street Development. 
Now on the surface, that feels wrong, right? That name of the person is in Front Street Development. But when you come down here, you'll see that it's actually printed as Front Street Development, but it's signed as sole member. So this is, a, I thought this was a really good example of how it's kind of hard to argue. It's technically right, but there's some nuance there. If I ask what is the name of the person who signed on behalf of Front Street, now what it's going to do is it's going to factor that in, and now it's going to try its best to try to understand what was actually put in here. And it didn't do a great job on that in that area, but it started to understand that Front Street wasn't a person. So these are just some examples here of some of the challenges in 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 perfection. We're not aiming for perfection here. We're aiming for speed. And in engaging with this, it 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 does help to be able to have the ability to jump out to a chat if need be. But also the ability to, when you have highly reusable ones, you can simply click a button and we'll pre-process a prompt and bring the information back to you, like I said. So these are examples. Go ahead, question. I was just going to say, I mean, I feel like the first example with the two different addresses showed the power mm -hmm. and the smartness of AI, right? Like it found the difference. And then you have other examples where you're trying to get it to do a little bit more, like just get a little bit smarter and figure out a name. Um, so I feel like there's just this natural question of, do you feel like this AI is learning? Yeah. So gr great point. So um, this also overlaps with things around privacy and there's different types of platforms that have different types of rules. What we do is we use, uh, we are currently built on top of OpenAI's uh, backend API. We don't use ChatGPT. ChatGPT is a, is a, end user product. When you put things into chat GPT, it uses those to train. There is a business side of their offering on the API side. We use that. And we do that purposefully because we do not want any data coming from a customer as part of a prompt to be kept by open AI and used by open AI. We would never want that. And they could never have, a, they could never have a business if they were doing that because nobody would want to put their details in there. So we use one that, that, that's not, that's not, training it to learn. Least Cake will ultimately be working on our own LLM, which may be seeded by something like that and then have a specialized uh, a real estate layer on top. And that's definitely something in the works and conversations we have every day. What's been beneficial is our ability to get something to market relatively quickly here that allows us to leverage what exists today, even if it isn't absolutely re uh, real estate specific, because the accuracy is at a point that clients love. It is at a very, very high clip um, and people are getting benefit out of it. But these are examples of opportunities for us to hone in on it, which is something that we will be able to do. I'm gonna move, I'm gonna move away from this for a second because I think that this is this is half of the, the equation here. And what I mean by that is this is a great example of using NLP, meaning we're typing in text. It understands what we're asking for. It's retrieving information from the document, but I'm not asking for its opinion. In fact, it's been coded to not give me an opinion. One of the things that's really key is, you may have heard the term hallucination. We do everything we can to on this side to prevent hallucinations because we're looking for facts, not opinions. But there are lots of different use cases where opinions are extremely valuable. And let me give you an example. Because one of the things that's really hard to read in real estate is the term language. So if you come down to take a look at the typical language in commercial real estate uh, contracts, it looks like this. It's this during the first comma of one ST comma full count year, the initial term in any portion. It's a lot of legalese and it's not very approachable. So this is a great example of where AI can be used to summarize things. So you let it give it a little bit of an opinion, but you keep it dialed into don't make anything up, just summarize it for me. So here's another service that we offer that CakeBot will just take any clause language that gets saved into the system and will auto summarize it so that it's a lot more approachable. This one's just telling me about my percent rent. Uh, I'm sorry, about my uh, cap on cam it being 5%. This one down here 
related to exclusivity is letting me know that that the landlord can't uh, sell sell or rent any space to a restaurant or retail or a restaurant tenant. Else, I can start paying twenty five percent of the rent until it's resolved. All this information's in here, but nobody wants to read it. So this is a great example of how AI can be used to summarize details, so that when you're looking at your whole entire portfolio and you want to take a look at your clause language or search across your portfolio, you don't have to be relying on just the clause language. You can be take a look at the the summary as well. So anyway, mm -hmm. these are some examples of how abstraction is what we're using to solve the first of those three steps as it relates to abstraction. But as we get here into the analysis part here, we want to talk about second, you can start to get an idea that if you can have a conversation with a document and you can have some pre-built ways of of looking at um, that that data, you could do some really interesting things. So as information moves out of abstraction into analyze, um, just a quick antidote. Uh, one one of one of the, the most common things we've been hearing from the industry and our customers is how can we help them quickly find risk in their in their contracts? And so they typically have. I have a I have a I have a list of things that I care about. I care about this type of exclusivity. I care about this. I want these types of rights for, for subleasing. I need to be able to sublease. I need to make sure that my I have X amount of renewals. I need to make sure that my rent bumps are only a certain amount, whatever that, that, that may be. The ability to collect those and to mass apply those to analyze existing and future contracts and produce a report that lets them know this is where you have issues allows customers to really fast track from getting a contract to redlining it to negotiating and getting things done. AI is, is, a, is going to be a wonderful, wonderful tool for that. And then lastly, once all this information is in there, making it available, think about using phones today. Think about your favorite apps. I'm betting the, the, one of the reasons that they're the, your favorite is they're simple. They're so easy to use. Handful of clicks, handful of swipes, getting information is simple. That type of stuff is not, is not as easy when you're talking about massive amounts of real estate data. So where I think AI is going here is it becomes the new layer that you communicate with your data through. So imagine walking down the street and needing to know what you have to worry about in the upcoming 60 days, being able to simply open up an app and say, what do I have due in the next 30 days? Or what leases are coming due? How much rent am I spending in Florida? The AI is a layer that can then go pull that data, organize it, show it back to you in seconds, I think is where we're going to start to see the most amount of AI advancements and how you engage with your data. Yeah. No, that sounds exciting. I feel like everything you're saying, like the, the thread that I keep hearing is save time. Like all of this AI is, is powerful, but it's not going to replace what you're doing, it's just going to help you do it so much faster. And I feel like that's what's exciting about it. It helps me do a lot more, absolutely, far more efficiently. It would take me weeks or months to physically go through a bunch of documents, reading through them, trying to figure out where I have risk. AI yeah. can go do it and do it in seconds, produce a report, <laughs> present it to me, and then let me then go in and even suggest edits. But ultimately, I'm going to be the one going and doing the negotiating. But now I can actually do it and get to there in minutes and hours instead of weeks and, day, and days and weeks and months. Yeah. Yeah. Well, this is a really uh, interesting conversation. Thanks for everyone who's on the line. Um, we're at around the 30 minute mark. So if you need to hop off, I totally understand. But if you want to stick around for some quick Q&A, um, anything that you would like to ask Dave or just about what is going on with Lease Cake or... Um, kind of what we're seeing in the market, feel free to use the Q&A box right now. Um, I've got a couple questions lined up for you, Dave, if you're ready. Yeah, sure. Go so, ahead. okay. First thing first, um, this goes back to when you showed during the abstraction process and you kind of talked about the difference of that OCR document or like version of it. What happens though, if you've got a really crappy document that you're trying to upload? Yeah. So it is, I've, continually impressed with the way that it's able to handle blurry stuff. But it, there, like anything else, if it gets to the point to where you can't even understand it as a human, the AI is going to have a hard time understanding it as well. So 
but it doesn't require absolute perfection. It's not like the only way a document works is if it's actually created in Adobe PDF, stored as a PDF, or or or, or, or saved as a PDF from Word or something like that. The heavy majority of the documents we get, especially the legacy ones, are typically scans. They're scans, they're tilted a bit, but they actually were like, they look like typewrite, typewritten types of stuff. It does a really good job of it, um, far better than it did a year ago. And I expect that that's only going to continue the ability for it to understand the industry under the industry that is building these tools understands that they cannot provide the value if they can't get the data out. So a lot of efforts going into making that better and it's getting better every day. Yeah, no, that makes sense. So let's talk a little bit about price because I feel like everyone's coming out with AI, but what do you feel like there should be like a high cost associated with this type of technology? Or do you think because it's so massively available, it's going to be something that's relatively affordable? Yes. And I say, I say that because it depends on what you're doing. Um, it, it, there's a lot of factors. I think there's the value side of it. I think there's actually the cost to build, the cost to provide, all those types of things that go into play. Our approach has been we want to make AI as approachable as possible. We realize that working directly with OpenAI is hard. We want to make working with Least Cake easy. So we create a layer that that abstracts the the need to worry about how to communicate with a backend tool. So what we do is pick particular features that align with core value propositions and they align with the different uh, levels of service that we provide. Every single thing that you saw today is in our lowest level of service. And our pricing is fully transparent. You can go to our website, click on pricing, and you can see it. We've got three different tiers today. And our lowest priced uh, tier has all of these features. Will every single AI feature we build go into the lowest tier? No. There are certain things we're going to build. They're going to take us a while to build. The value is going to be different. Our costs are going to be different. And we will put them through there. And that's why I answered. I wasn't trying to be flippant. That's why I answered the question is yes. Because it's a little bit of both, but it, we're making it uh, extremely affordable and extremely approachable. Yeah, no, that makes sense. I, I feel like too, so we've got some of the questions come in that I feel like we're all thinking the same thing. We've seen a lot of AI that's pieces of this. There's AI for abstraction. There's a dozen companies that can do abstraction right now. There's quite a few business intelligence platforms that are you know, really using AI to help you with your reports. But I feel like what we're seeing here is this one platform that can do multiple types of minimizing risk through AI. So where do you feel like, what can, what can we do today? And where are we going to be in the future with some of these products that you're talking about? Yeah. So I, I'll have it ties back to that, the one, two, three thing I was talking about. So we really want, we can't focus on democratization if we can't, if we don't have data prepared and we can't have data prepared if we can't get data out so we are we are focusing from a left to right approach we are now at a point where we have a, most of our customers are now leveraging this whether we're doing it as doing the doing the abstraction for them we have a lot we have a growing number of clients that are doing their own diy abstractions using this every single piece of information that goes into system today is going through the tool you just saw so we're moving away from that a little bit and now starting to focus on that that second stage. The second stage is going to be about how do we specifically help make sure that areas of risk for our clients are automatically identified. So it's less about using AI to build a pie chart. It's more about using AI to identify areas that a flashlight needs to be shown on. So much risk exists in, in our client's portfolio because they're just currently blind to it. So we're looking at AI to be able to shine that flashlight directly on those areas and bring that back to them. Will our platform get to the point where we're using AI to build charts and things like that on the fly? Yes, I think we ultimately will because of the third one. Any opportunity we can use to have AI become the communication layer, that I think is our ultimate goal when we talk about democratization. Because the only, because we do everything we can to make our interface as easy as possible. Click on the left, get information. We send information to you. We do that. But I don't think there's anything easier than just being able to express your need audibly or type it into a box and have it brought back. That's our end game. Our end game is to be able to make it that simple. Tell me what I need to care about and the system will tell you what you need to care about. 
That's where we're ultimately going. So is that everything? No, there's lots of different other things you can do with AI, but that's a lot of the things that we care about. Yeah. So what about the example you showed today was at least in an amendment, right? Mm -hmm. What about other types of documents for people who have, you know, a lot going on at their locations? They've got warranties and different agreements. Can AI do anything for them? Same stuff I showed you. Yeah. Same stuff I showed you. Available for contracts, licenses, all those different types of things. It's just slightly different. Instead of me asking you what, if you have CAM, it's going to ask you questions about contracts. But the underlying tech is still the same. It is there are certain things that you that matter within the context of whatever you're working on. AI is there along the way to help find those, pinpoint them as fast as possible, bring them to you, and then get the stuff into the system. So we typically show leases because that is probably the dominant thing that's in our system in terms of importance. But you're right. Permits, licenses, franchise agreements, any type of contract, warranties, anything with a critical date, dollar, or detail gets in our system. And it all comes in the same way you just saw today, just not least specific. It would be whatever the other context is. Yeah, cool. All right, I've got one more question sure. and then I'm going to preview our next two webinars for anyone who's interested. So last question, Dave, um, what about the future of like contract negotiation? This is gonna be a big thing, I think for people trying to save money, increase those margins. I wanna make sure I sign the best contracts possible. Mm -hmm. Is that where Lease Cake is also thinking? Is that where their mind is going of doing something around negotiations? Yeah, so I, I think there's a natural thing there. So if you if you think about if you think about your portfolio today and you have hundreds of contracts, if I were to say AI is a great tool to be able to identify risk in those contracts, the same technology could be look could be forward looking. So if I know that what matters to you and your business are these eight points, AI is a great tool to be able to go figure out within a contract waiting to be signed, like an LOI or something like that. How am I doing relative to my eight points and the ability to score and say, you know what? You got what you wanted here. You're all good here. Nope, there's friction here. And this is a must have according to your goals here. Here is some, and here's where you have generative AI. Here is some suggested language you might want to take back to the counterparty because I can start to see what their goal is and I know what your goal is. Let me try to find something in the middle. That's a wonderful use case for AI. So I think- that's where you're going to start to see things happen is moving in that direction because it can speed up, get to the point, find the friction, figure out how to eliminate the friction, execute the contract. Again, weeks and months go down to days and minutes uh, with, the, with the, the help of these large language models. Yeah. Oh, that makes me excited, man. I mean, real estate is not the most quick turnaround industry. So to cut down the amount of time you're spending in emails asking the same thing over and over again to have AI help you, it's going to be a great world. Absolutely. And both parties want that. Nobody yeah. wants things to drag out. So that's the nice thing they can both agree on. Let's get it done faster. Yeah, cool. All right. Well, I appreciate it. Um, let me give our audience here a preview of what is coming up in the next couple of weeks. So we like to do a couple of webinars a month. Um, this month, obviously, was our fireside chat, but we've also got one more that is about tax. Can you click for me, Dave? Uh, yes, I am trying. <laughs> it's, frozen. It's, it's not going for me. It's not, That's trying. so weird. Okay, that's yeah. fine. That's fine. We have a webinar. It's <laughs> I trust you. Okay. We, who knows what's wrong with it? We've got a webinar next um, <clears throat> on April 27th, where we're going to be meeting with um, one of our partners who is all about cost segregation. They're actually like tax experts, and they're going to help you figure out some ways to get rid of some of those um, income tax burdens and actually maximize some of the savings that you've got when it comes to building new stores. So if you're interested in that, we will send you a follow-up email. And then in May, we're actually going to be meeting with one of our LeaseCake customers um, who is a fitness uh, franchisee in the entertainment fitness space. They've got about 70 locations. And we're going to be hearing from them as they went through an acquisition through um, a larger brand portfolio that had acquired them, self-esteem brands. We're actually going to be hearing how self-esteem brands and how this Omega Fitness um, franchisee were working together to build great relationships. And you might be really interested in this one because Omega is one of our power child power users of 
CakeBot, which we showed today. So he's going to give you some tips on how he took 70 leases from a brand new company merger and got them into Lease Cake in a couple of days. So he's going to give some of his background on how we did that and just talk a little bit more about the franchisee franchisor relationship. But I appreciate everyone um, being here today. Thanks for sticking it out all the way to 45 minutes. We will send you all a follow-up email. If you are interested in what we talked about today, we would love to chat with you more. You can always let us know by submitting a contact card on Leasecake or just reply to any emails that we send you. But hope you have a great rest of your day and we look forward to seeing what AI does in the next coming months. Thanks, Jenny. Appreciate chat as always. <laughs> all right. See ya. Bye. See ya.